The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter One Civilizing Huck. Miss Watson, Tom Sawyer, waits. You don't know about me without you have read a book by the name of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, but that ain't no matter. That book was made by Mr. Mark Twain, and he told the truth mainly. There was things which he stretched, but mainly he told the truth. That is nothing. I never seen anybody but lied one time or another. Without it was Aunt Polly, or the widow, or maybe Mary. Aunt Polly, Tom's Aunt Polly, she is, and Mary, and the widow Douglas, as all told about in that book, which is mostly a true book, with some stretchers, as I said before. Now the way that book winds up is this. Tom and me found the money that the robbers hid in the cave, and it made us rich. We got six thousand dollars apiece, all gold. It was an awful sight of money when it was piled up. Well, Judge Thatcher, he took it and put it out at interest. And it fetched us a dollar a day apiece, all the year round, more than a body could tell what to do with. The widow Douglas, she took me for her son, and allowed she would civilize me. But it was rough living in that house all the time, considering how dismal, regular, and decent the widow was in all her ways. And so when I couldn't stand it no longer, I lit out. I got into my old rags and my sugar hog's head again, and was free and satisfied. But Tom Sawyer, he hunted me up, and said he was going to start a band of robbers, and I might join if I would go back to the widow and be respectable. So I went back. The widow, she cried over me, and called me a poor lost lamb, and she called me a lot of other names too, but she never meant no harm by it. She put me in them new clothes again, and I couldn't do nothing but sweat and sweat and feel all cramped up. Well, then, the old thing commenced again. The widow rung a bill for supper, and you had to come to time. When you got to the table, you couldn't go right to eatin', but you had to wait for the widow to tuck down her head and grumble a little over the victuals, though there weren't really anything the matter with them. That is, nothing, only everything was cooked by itself. In a barrel of odds and ends, it is different. Things get mixed up, and the juice kind of swaps around and the things go better. After supper, she got out her book and learned me about Moses and the bulrushers, and I was in a sweat to find out all about him. But by and by, she let it out that Moses had been dead a considerable long time. So then, I didn't care no more about him, because I don't take no stock in dead people. Pretty soon, I wanted to smoke, and asked the widow to let me, but she wouldn't. She said it was a mean practice, and wasn't clean, and I must try not to do it any more. That is just the way with some people. They get down on a thing when they don't know nothing about it. Here she was a-bothering about Moses, which was no kin to her, and no use to anybody. Being gone, you see, yet finding a power of fault with me for doing a thing that had some good in it, and she took snuff, too. Of course, that was all right, because she'd done it herself. Her sister, Miss Watson, a tolerable slim old maid with goggles on, had just come to live with her and took a sat at me now with a spellin' book. She worked me middlin' hard for about an hour, and then the widow made her ease up. I couldn't stood it much longer. Then for an hour it was deadly dull, and it was fidgety. Miss Watson would say, Don't put your feet up there, Huckleberry. And, Don't scrunch up like that, Huckleberry. Sit up straight. And pretty soon she would say, Don't gap and stretch like that, Huckleberry. Why don't you try to behave? and then she told me all about the bad place, and I said I wished I was there. She got mad then, but I didn't mean no harm. All I wanted was to go somewheres. All I wanted was a change. I weren't particular. She said it was wicked to say what I said, said she wouldn't say it for the whole world. She was going to live so as to go to the good place. Well, I couldn't see no advantage in going where she was going, so I made up my mind I wouldn't try for it. But I never said so, because it would only make trouble, and wouldn't do no good. Now she had got a start, and she went on and told me all about the good place. She said all a body would have to do there was to go around all day long with a harp and sing, forever and ever. So I didn't think much of it, but I never said so. I asked her if she reckoned Tom Sawyer would go there, and she said not by a considerable sight. I was glad about that because I wanted him and me to be together. Miss Watson, she kept pecking at me, 
and I got tiresome and lonesome. By and by, they fetched the niggers in and had prayers, and then everybody was off to bed. I went up to my room with a piece of candle and put it on the table. Then I sat down in a chair by the window and tried to think of something cheerful, but it weren't no use. I felt so lonesome I most wish I was dead. The stars were shining and the leaves rustled in the woods, ever so mournful, and I heard an owl away off booing about something that was dead, and a whippoorwill, and a dog crying about somebody that was going to die, and the wind was trying to whisper something to me, and I couldn't make out what it was, and so it made the cold shivers run over me. Then away out in the woods I heard that kind of a sound that a ghost makes when it wants to tell about something that's on its mind and can't make itself understood, and so can't rest easy in its grave, and has to go about that way every night grieving. I got so downhearted and scared I did wish I had some company. Pretty soon a spider went crawling up my shoulder, and I flipped it off and it lit it in the candle, and before I could budge it was all shriveled up. I didn't need anybody to tell me that that was an awful bad sign and would fetch me some bad luck, so I was scared, and most shook the clothes off of me. I got up and turned around in my tracks three times and crossed my breast every time, and then I tied up a little lock of my hair with a thread to keep witches away, but I had no confidence. You do that when you're lost a horseshoe that you found, instead of nailing it up over the door. But I hadn't ever heard anybody say it was any way to keep off bad luck when you killed a spider. I sat down again, a shaking all over, and got out my pipe for a smoke, for the house was all as still as death now, and so the widow wouldn't know. Well, after a long time, I heard the clock away off in the town go boom, 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 twelve licks, and all still again, stiller than ever. Pretty soon, I heard a twig snap down in the dark amongst the trees. Something was a-stirring. I sat still and listened. Directly, I could just barely hear a meow, meow, down there. That was good. Says I, meow, meow, as soft as I could, and then I put out the light and scrambled out of the window onto the shed. And then I slipped down the ground and crawled in among the trees, and sure enough, there was Tom Sawyer waiting for me. End of chapter 1 The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain Chapter 2 The Boys Escape Jim Tom Sawyer's Gang Deep Laid Plans we went tiptoeing along a path amongst the trees, back towards the end of the widow's garden, stooping down so as the branches wouldn't scrape our heads. When we was passing by the kitchen, I fell over a root and made a noise. We scrouched down and laid still. Miss Watson's big nigger, named Jim, was sitting in the kitchen door. We could see him pretty clear, because there was a light behind him. He got up and stretched his neck out, about a minute listening. Then he says, Who da? He listened some more. Then he came tiptoeing down and stood right between us. We could have touched him nearly. Well, likely it was minutes and minutes that there weren't a sound, and we all there were close together. There was a place in my ankle that got to itching, but I doesn't scratch it, and then my ear began to itch, and next my back, right between my shoulders. Seemed like I'd die if I couldn't scratch. Well, I've noticed that thing plenty of times since. If you are with the quality, or at a funeral, or trying to go to sleep when you ain't sleepy, if you are anywheres where it won't do for you to scratch, why, you will itch all over and upwards of a thousand places. Pretty soon, Jim says, Say who is you? Why is you? Dog my cats if I didn't hear something. Well, I know what I was going to do. I was going to sit down here and listen till I hears it again. So he sat down on the ground betwixt me and Tom. He leaned his back up against the tree and stretched his legs out till one of them most touched one of mine. My nose began to itch. It itched till the tears came into my eyes, but I doesn't scratch. Then it began to itch on the inside. Next it got to itching underneath. I didn't know how I was going to sit still. This miserableness went on as much as six or seven minutes, but it seemed a sight longer than that. I was itching 
in eleven different places now. I reckon I couldn't stand it more than a minute longer. But I set my teeth hard and got ready to try. Just then, Jim began to breathe heavy. Next, it began to snore. And then, I was pretty soon comfortable again. Tom, he made a sign to me, kind of a little noise with his mouth, and we went creeping away on our hands and knees. When we was ten foot off, Tom whispered to me, and wanted to tie Jim to the tree for fun. But I said no. He might wake, and make a disturbance, and then they'd find out I weren't in. Then Tom said he hadn't got candles enough, and he would slip in the kitchen and get some more. I didn't want him to try. I said Jim might wake up and come, but Tom wanted to risk it. So we slid in there and got three candles, and Tom laid five cents on the table for pay. Then we got out, and I was in a sweat to get away. But nothing would do Tom, but he must crawl to where Jim was, on his hands and knees, and play something on him. I waited, and it seemed a good while. Everything was so still and lonesome. As soon as Tom was back, we cut along the path around the garden fence and by and by fetched up on the steep top of the hill the other side of the house tom said he slipped jim's hat off off his head and hung it on a limb right over him and jim stirred a little but he didn't wake afterwards jim said the witches bewitched him and put him in a trance and rode him all over the state and then set him under the trees again and hung his hat on a limb to show who done it and next time jim told it he said they rode him down to new orleans and after that, every time he told it, he spread it more and more, till by and by he said they rode him all over the world, and tired him most to death, and his back was all over saddle boils. Jim was monstrous proud about it, and he got so he wouldn't hardly notice the other niggers. Niggers would come for miles to hear Jim tell about it, and he was more looked up to than any nigger in the country. Strange niggers would stand with their mouths open and look him all over, seem as if he was a wonder. Niggas is always talking about witches in the dark by the kitchen fire, but when everyone was talking and letting on to know all about such things, Jim would happen in and say, <laughs> What you know about witches? And that nigger was corked up and had to take a back seat. Jim always kept that five cent piece round his neck with a string and said it was a charm the devil gave to him with his own hands and told him he could cure anybody with it and fetch witches whenever he wanted to, just by saying something to it. But he never told what it was, he said to it. Niggas would come from all around there, and give Jim anything they had, just for a sight of that five cent piece. But they wouldn't touch it, because the devil had had his hands on it. Jim was most ruined for a servant, because he got stuck up on account of having seen a devil, and been rode by witches. Well, when Tom and me got to the edge of the hilltop, we looked away down in the village, and could see three or four lights twinkling, where there was sick folks, maybe, and the stars over us was sparkling ever so fine, and down by the village was the river, a whole mile broad, and awful still and grand. We went down the hill and found Joe Harper, and Ben Rogers, and two or three more of the boys, hid in the old tan yard. So we unhitched a skiff, and pulled down the river two mile and a half to the big scar on the hillside, and went ashore. We went to a clump of bushes, and time made everybody swear to keep a secret, and then showed them a hole in the hill, right in the thickest part of the bushes. Then we lit the candles, and crawled in on our hands and knees. We went about two hundred yards, and then the cave opened up. Tom poked about amongst the passages, and pretty soon ducked under a wall, where he couldn't have noticed that there was a hole. We went along a narrow place, and got into a kind of room, all damp and sweaty and cold, and there we stopped. Tom says, Now, we'll start this band of robbers, and call it Tom Sawyer's gang. Everybody that wants to join has got to take an oath, and write his name in blood. Everybody was willing, so Tom got out a sheet of paper that he had wrote the oath on, and read it. It swore every boy to stick to the band, and never tell any of the secrets. And if anybody had done anything to any boy in the band, Whichever boy was ordered to kill that person, and his family must do it. And he mustn't eat, and he mustn't sleep, till he had killed him, and hacked the cross on their breasts, which was a sign of the band, and nobody that didn't belong to the band could use that mark. And if he did, 
he must be sued. And if he done it again, he must be killed. And if anybody that belonged to the band told the secrets, he must have his throat cut, and then have his carcass burn up, and the ashes scattered all around, and his name blotted out of the list with blood, and never mentioned again by the gang, but have a curse put on it, and be forgotten forever. Everybody said it was a real beautiful oath, and asked Tom if he had got it out of his own head. He said some of it, but the rest was out of the pirate books, and robber books, and every gang that was high-toned had it. Some thought it would be good to kill the families of the boys that told the secrets. Tom said it was a good idea, so we took a pencil and wrote it in. Then Ben Rogers says, Here's Huck Finn. He ain't got no family. What you gonna do about him? Well, ain't he got a father? Says Tom Sawyer. Yes, he's got a father, but you can't never find him these days. He used to lay drunk with the hogs in the tan yard, but he ain't been seen in these parts for a year or more. They talked it over, and they was going to rule me out, because they said every boy must have a family or somebody to kill, or else it wouldn't be fair and square for the others. Well, nobody could think of anything to do. Everybody was stumped and sat still. I was most ready to cry, but all at once I thought of a way, and so I offered them Miss Watson. They could kill her. Everybody said, Oh, oh she'll, she'll do. do. That's, That's all right. right. Huck, Huck can, can come in. in. Then they all stuck a pen in their fingers to get blood to sign with, and I made my mark on the paper. Now, says Ben Rogers, what's the line of business of this gang? Nothing. Only robbery and murder, Tom said. But who are we going to rob? Houses or cattle or... Stuff. Stealing cattle and such things ain't robbery, it's burglary, says Tom Sawyer. We ain't burglars. That ain't no sort of style. We are highwaymen. We stop stages and carriages on the road with masks on and kill the people and take their watches and money. Must we always kill the people? Oh, certainly. It's best. Some authorities think different, but mostly it's considered best to kill them. Except some that you bring to the cave here and keep them till they're ransomed. Ransomed? What's that? I don't know. But that's what they do. I've seen it in books. And so, of course, that's what we've got to do. But how can we do it if we don't know what it is? Why, blame it all, we've got to do it. Don't I tell you it's in the books? Do you want to go to doing different from what's in the books and get things all muddled up? Oh, that's all very fine to say, Tom Sawyer. But how in the nation are these fellows going to be ransomed if we don't know how to do it to them? That's the thing I want to get at. Now, what do you reckon it is? Well, I don't know. But perhaps if we keep them till they're ransomed, it means that we keep them till they're dead. Now, that's something like. That'll answer. Why couldn't you have said that before? We'll keep them till they're ransomed to death, and the bothersome lot they'll be, too, eating up everything and always trying to get loose. How you talk, Ben Rogers. How can they get loose when there's a guard over them, ready to shoot them down if they move a peg? A guard? Well, that is good. So somebody's got to sit up all night and never get any sleep just so as to watch them. I think that's foolishness. Why can't a body take a club and ransom them just as soon as they get here? Because it ain't in the book so. That's why. Now, Ben Rogers, do you want to do things regular or don't you? That's the idea. Don't you reckon that the people that made the books knows what's the correct thing to do? Do you reckon you can learn them anything? Not by a good deal. No, sir, we'll just go on and ransom them in the regular way. All right, I don't mind, but I say it's a full way anyhow. Say, do we kill the women too? Well, Ban Rogers, if I was as ignorant as you, I wouldn't let on. Kill the women? No. Nobody ever saw anything in the books like that. You fetch them to the cave, and you're always as polite as pie to them. And by and by they fall in love with you and never want to go home any more. Well, if that's the way I'm agreed, but I don't take no stock in it. Mighty soon we'll have the cave so cluttered up with women and fellows waiting to be ransomed that there won't be no place for the robbers. But go ahead, I ain't got nothing to say. Little Tommy Barnes was asleep now, and when they wakened him up, he was scared and cried and said he wanted to go home to his ma and didn't want to be a robber any more. So they all made fun of him and called him crybaby, and that made him mad, and he said 
he would go straight and tell all the secrets. But Tom gave him five cents to keep quiet, and said we'd all go home, and meet next week, and rob somebody, and kill some people. Ben Rogers said he couldn't get out much, only Sundays, and so he wanted to begin next Sunday. But all the boys said it would be wicked to do it on Sunday, and that settled the thing. They agreed to get together, and fix a day as soon as they could, and then we elected Tom Sawyer, first captain, and Joe Harper, second captain of the gang, and so started for home. I club up the shed, and crept into my window, just before day was breaking. My new clothes was all greased up and clayey, and I was dog-tired. End of chapter 2THE ADVENTURES OF HUCKLEBERRY FINN BY MARK TWAIN CHAPTER THREE A GOOD GOING OVER GRACE TRIUMPHANT ONE OF TOM SAWYER'S his LIES Well, I got a good going over in the morning from old Miss Watson on account of my clothes. But the widow, she didn't scold, but only cleaned up the grease and clay, and looked so sorry that I thought I would behave a while if I could. But Miss Watson, she took me in the closet and prayed but nothing come of it. She told me to pray every day, and whatever I asked for, I would get it. But it weren't so. I tried it. Once I got a fish line, but no hooks. It weren't any good to me without hooks. I tried for the hooks three or four times, but somehow I couldn't make it work. By and by, one day, I asked Miss Watson to try for me, but she said I was a fool. She never told me why and I couldn't make it out no way. I sat down one time back in the woods, and had a long think about it. I says to myself, If a body can get anything they pray for, why don't Deacon Wynn get back the money he lost on pork? Why can't the widow get back her silver snuff-box that was stole? Why can't Miss Watson fat up? No, says I to myself, there ain't nothing in it. I went and told the widow about it, and she said the thing a body could get by praying for it was spiritual gifts. This was too many for me, but she told me what she meant and must help other people and do everything I could for other people and look out for them all the time and never think about myself. This was including Miss Watson, as I took it. I went out in the woods and turned it over in my mind a long time, but I couldn't see no advantage about it except for the other people. So at last I reckoned I wouldn't worry about it any more, but just let it go. Sometimes the widow would take me one side and talk about Providence in a way to make a body's mouth water, but maybe the next day Miss Watson would take hold and knock it all down again. I judged I could see that there was two Providences, and the poor chap would stand considerable show with the widow's Providence, but if Miss Watson's got him there, weren't no help for him any more. I thought it all out. I reckoned I would belong to the widows if she wanted me, though I couldn't make out how he was a goin' to be any better off than then what he was before, seeing I was so ignorant and so kind of low down and ornery. Pap, he hadn't been seen for more than a year, and that was comfortable for me. I didn't want to see him no more. He used to always wail me when he was sober and could get his hands on me, though I used to take to the woods most of the time, when he was around. Well, about this time, he was found in the river drowned, about twelve mile above town, so people said. They judged it was him, anyway. Said this drowned man was just his size, and was ragged, and had uncommon long hair, which was all like pap, but they couldn't make nothing out of his face, because it had been in the water for so long, it weren't much of a face at all. They said he was floating on his back in the water, they took him and buried him on the bank, but I weren't comfortable long because I happened to think of something. I knowed mighty well that a drowned man don't float on his back but on his face. So I knowed then that this weren't Pap, but a woman dressed up in a man's clothes. So I was uncomfortable again. I judged the old man would turn up again by and by, though I wished he wouldn't. We played robber now, and then about a month and then I resigned. All the boys did. We hadn't robbed nobody, hadn't killed any people, but only just pretended. We used to hop out of the woods 
and go charging down on hog drivers and women in carts taking garden stuff to market but we never halved any of them tom sawyer called the hogs ingots and he called the turnips in the stuffed jewelry and we would go to the cave and pow wow over what we had done and how many people we had killed and marked but i couldn't see no profit in it one time tom sent a boy to run about town with a blazing stick which he called a slogan which was the sign for the gang to get together and then he said he had got secret news by his spies that next day a whole parcel of spanish merchants and rich arabs was going to camp in cave hollow with two hundred elephants and six hundred camels and over a thousand sumpter mules all loaded down with diamonds and they didn't have only a guard or four hundred soldiers and so we would lay an ambuscade as he called it and kill the lot and scoop the things he said we must slick up our swords and guns and get ready he never could go after even a turnip cart but he must have the swords and the guns all scoured up for it though they was only lath and broomsticks and you might scour at them till you rotted and then they weren't worth a mouthful of ashes more than what they was before i didn't believe we could lick such a crowd of spaniards and arabs but i wanted to see the camels and elephants so i was on hand next day saturday in the ambuscade and when we got the word we rushed out of the woods and down the hill and there weren't no spaniards and arabs and there weren't no camels nor elephants it weren't anything but a sunday school picnic and only a primer class at that we busted it up and chased the children up the hollow but we never got anything but some doughnuts and jam though ben rogers got a rag doll and joe harper got a hymn book and a tract and then the teacher charged in and made us drop everything and cut i didn't see no diamonds and i told tom sawyer so he said there was loads of them there anyway and he said there was arabs there too and elephants and things i said why couldn't we see him then he said if i weren't so ignorant but had read a book called don quixote i would know without asking he said it was all done by enchantment he said there was hundreds of soldiers there and elephants and treasure and so on but we had enemies which he called magicians and they had turned the whole thing into an infant sunday school just out of spite i said all right then the thing for us to do was to go for the magicians tom sawyer said i was a numbskull why said he a magician could call up a lot of genies and they would hash you up like nothing before you could say jack robinson they are as tall as a tree and as big around as a church well i says suppose we got some genies to help us can't we lick the other crowd then how are you gonna get them i don't know how do they get them why they rub an old tin lamp or an iron ring and then the genies come tearing in with the thunder and lightning a ripping around and the smoke a rolling and everything's they're told to do they up and do it they don't think nothing upon the shot tower up by the roots and belting a sunday school superintendent over the head with it or any other man who makes them tear around so why whoever rubs the lamp or the ring they belong to whoever rubs the lamp or the ring and they've got to do whatever he says if he tells them to build a palace forty miles long out of diamonds and fill it full of chewing gum or whatever you want and fetch an emperor's daughter from china for you to marry they've got to do it and they've got to do it before sunup next morning too and more they've got to waltz that palace around over the country wherever you want it you understand well says i i think they are a pack of flatheads for not keeping the palace themselves stead of fooling them away like that and what's more if i was one of them i would see a man in jericho before i would drop my business and come to him for the rubbing of an old tin lamp how you talk huck finn why you'd have to come when he rubbed it whether you wanted to or not what and i as high as a tree and as big as a church all right then i would come but i lay i'd make that man climb the highest tree there was in the country shucks it ain't no use to talk to you huck finn 
You don't seem to know anything somehow. A perfect sap head. I thought this all over for two or three days, and then I reckoned I would see if there was anything in it. I got an old tin lamp and an iron ring, and went out in the woods and rubbed and rubbed till I sweat like an engine, calculating to build a palace and sell it, but it weren't no use. None of the genies come. So then I judged that all the stuff was only just one of Tom Sawyer's lies. I reckoned he believed in the Arabs and the elephants, but as for me, I think different. It had all the marks of a Sunday school. End of chapter 3「The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn » by Mark Twain Chapter 4 – Huck and the Judge Superstition Well, three or four months went along, and it was well into the winter now. I had been to school most of the time, and could spell and read and write just a little, and could say the multiplication table up to six times seven is thirty-five, and I don't reckon I could ever get any further than that if I was to live forever. I don't take no stock in mathematics anyway. At first I hated the school, but by and by I got so I could stand it. Whenever I got uncommon tired, I played hooky, and the hiding I got next day done me good and cheered me up. So the longer I went to school, the easier it got to be. I was getting sort of used to the widow's ways, too, and they weren't so raspy on me. Living in a house and sleeping in a bed pulled on me pretty tightly, mostly. But before the cold weather, I used to slide out and sleep in the woods, sometimes, and so that was a rest to me. I liked the old ways best, but I was getting so I liked the new ones, too, a little bit. The widow said I was coming along slow but sure, and doing very satisfactory. She said she weren't ashamed of me. One morning, I happened to turn over the salt cellar at breakfast. I reached for some of it as quick as I could to throw over my left shoulder and keep off the bad luck. But Miss Watson was in ahead of me and crossed me off. She says, Take your hands away, Huckleberry. What a mess you're always making. The widow put in a good word for me but that weren't going to keep off the bad luck. I knowed that well enough. I started out after breakfast, feeling worried and shaky, and wondering where it was going to fall on me, and what it was going to be. There is ways to keep off some kinds of bad luck, but this wasn't one of them kind, so I never tried to do anything, but just poked along, low-spirited, and on the watch out. I went down to the front garden, and clumb over the stile, where you go through the high board fence. There was an inch of new snow on the ground, and I seen somebody's tracks. They had come up from the quarry, and stood around the stile a while, and then went on around the garden fence. It was funny they hadn't come in after standing around so. I couldn't make it out. It was very curious somehow. I was going to follow around, but I stooped down to look at the tracks first. I didn't notice anything at first, but next I did. There was a cross in the left boot heel, made with big nails to keep off the devil. I was up in a second, and shining down the hill. I looked over my shoulder every now and then, but I didn't see nobody. I was at Judge Thatcher's as quick as I could get there, he said. Why, my boy, you are all out of breath. Did you come for your interest? No, sir, I says. Is there some for me? Oh, yes, a half yearly is in last night. Over a hundred and fifty dollars. Quite a fortune for you. You had better let me invest it along with your six thousand, because if you take it, you'll spend it. No, sir, I says. I don't want to spend it. I don't want at all. No, the six thousand neither. I want you to take it. I want to give it to you, the six thousand and all. He looked surprised. He couldn't make it out, he says. Why, what can you mean, my boy? I says, don't you ask me no questions about it, please. You'll take it, won't you? He says, well, I'm puzzled. 
Is something the matter? Please take it, says I, and don't ask me nothing. Then I won't have to tell no lies. He studied a while, and then he says, Aha. Uh -huh. I think I see. You want to sell all your property to me, not give it. That's the correct idea. Then he wrote something on a paper, and read it over, and says, There, you see, it says, For consideration. That means I have bought it of you and paid you for it. Here's a dollar for you. Now you sign it. So I signed it and left. Miss Watson's nigger Jim had a hairball as big as your fist, which had been took out of the fourth stomach of an ox, and he used to do magic with it. He said there was a spirit inside of it, and it knowed everything. So I went to him that night and told him Pap was here again, for I found his tracks in the snow. What I wanted to know was what he was going to do, and was he going to stay. Jim got out his hairball and said something over it, and then he held it up and dropped it to the floor. It fell pretty solid and only rolled about an inch. Jim tried it again, and then another time, and it acted just the same. Jim got down on his knees and put his ear against it and listened. But it weren't no use. He said it wouldn't talk. He said sometimes it wouldn't talk without money. I told him I had an old stick counterfeit quarter that weren't no good because the brass showed through the silver a little and it wouldn't pass no how even if the brass didn't show because it was so slick it felt greasy and so that would tell on it every time. I reckoned I wouldn't say nothing about the dollar I got from the judge. I said it was pretty bad money but maybe the hairball would take it because maybe it wouldn't know the difference. Jim smelt it and bit it and rubbed it and said he would manage so the hairball would think it was good. He said he would split open a raw Irish potato and stick the quarter in between and keep it there all night. And next morning you couldn't see no brass and it wouldn't feel greasy no more. And so anybody in town would take it in a minute, let alone a hairball. Well, I knowed a potato would do that before, but I had forgot it. Jim put the quarter under the hairball and got down and listened again. This time he said the hairball was all right. He said it would tell my whole fortune if I wanted it to. I says go on. So the hairball talked to Jim, and Jim told it to me. He says, Your old father don't know yet what he's going to do. Sometimes he spec he'll go away, and then again he spec he'll stay. The best way is to rest easy and let the old man take his own way. There's two angels hovering round about him. One of them is white and shiny, and the other one is black. The white one gets him to go right a little while. Then the black one sail in and bust it all up. A body can't tell yet which one want to fetch him in the last. But you is all right. You going to have considerable trouble in your life. And considerable joy. Sometimes you going to get hot. And sometimes you going to get sick. But every time you going to get well again. There's two gals flying about you in your life. One of them's light and the other one is dark. One is rich and the other is poor. You's going to marry the poor one first and the rich one by and by. You wants to keep away from the water as much as you kin, and don't run no risk case it's down in the bills that you going to get hung. When I lit my candle and went up to my room that night, there sat Pop, his own self. 
End of chapter 4「The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn » by Mark Twain Chapter 5 Huck's Father The Fond Parent Reform I had shut the door, too. Then I turned around, and there he was. I used to be scared of him all the time. He tanned me so much. I reckoned I was scared now, too. But in a minute, I see I was mistaken. That is, after the first jolt, as you may say, when my breath sort of hitched, he being so unexpected, but right away, after I see I wasn't scared of him, worth bothering about. He was most of fifty, and he looked it. His hair was long and tangled and greasy, and hung down, and you could see his eyes shining through like he was behind vines. It was all black, no gray. So was his long mixed-up whiskers. There weren't no color in his face. Where his face showed, it was white. Not like another man's white, but a white to make a body sick. A white to make a body's flesh crawl. A tree toad white. A fish belly white. As for his clothes, just rags. That was all. He had one ankle resting on to other knee. The boot on that foot was busted, and two of his toes stuck through and he worked them now and then. His hat was laying on the floor, an old black slouch with the top caved in like a lid. I stood a-looking at him. He sat there a-looking at me, with his chair tilted back a little. I set the candle down. I noticed the window was up, so we had climbed in by the shed. He kept a-looking me all over. By and by, he says, starchy clothes very you think you're a good deal of a big bug don't you maybe i am maybe i ain't i says don't you give me none of your lip says he you've put on considerable many frills since i've been away i'll take you down a peg before i get done with you you're educated too they say can read and write you think you're better than your father now don't you because he can't i'll take it out of you who told you you might meddle with such highfalutin foolishness, hey? Who told you you could? The widow, she told me. The widow, hey? And who told the widow she could put in her shovel about a thing that ain't none of her business? Nobody never told her. Well, I'll learn her how to meddle. And looky here, you drop that school, you hear? I'll learn people to bring up a boy to put on airs over his own father and let on to be better than he is. You let me catch you foolin' around that school again, you hear? Your mother couldn't read, and she couldn't write another before she died. None of the family could before they died. I can't, and here you're a-swellin' yourself up like this. I ain't the man to stand it, you hear? Say, let me hear you read. I took up a book and began something about General Washington and the wars. When I'd read about a half a minute, he fetched the book a whack with his hand and knocked it across the house he says it's so you can do it i had my doubts when you told me now looky here you stop that putting on frills i won't have it i'll lay for you my smarty and if i catch you about that school i'll tan you good first you know you'll get religion too i never seen such a son he took up a little blue and yaller picture of some cows and a boy and says what's this it's something they give me for learning my lessons good. He tore it up and says, I'll give you something better. I'll give you a cowhide. He sat there a mumbling and a growling a minute. And then he says, Ain't you a sweet scented dandy, though? A bed and bedclothes and a looking glass and a piece of carpet on the floor. And your own father got to sleep with the hogs in the tan yard. I never see such a son. I bet I'll take some of these frills out of you before I'm done with you. Why, there ain't no end to your airs. They see you're rich. Hey, how's that? They lie. That's how. Looky here. Mind how you talk to me. I'm a-standin' about all I can stand now, so don't give me no sass. I've been in town two days, and I ain't heard nothin' but about you being rich. I heard about it away down the river, too. That's why I come. You get me that money tomorrow. I want it. I ain't got no money. It's a lie. 
Judge Thatcher's got it. You get it. I want it. I hain't got no money, I tell you. You ask Judge Thatcher. He'll tell you the same. All right, I'll ask him, and I'll make him pungle too, or I'll know the reason why. Say, how much you got in your pocket? I want it. I hain't got only a dollar, and I want that too. It don't make no difference what you want it for. You just shell it out. He took it and bid it to see if it was good, and then he said he was going down to town to get some whiskey. Said he hadn't got a drink all day. When he had got out on the shed, he put his head in again and cussed me for putting on frills and trying to be better than him. And when I reckoned he was gone, he come back and put his head in again and told me to mind about that school, because he was going to lay for me and lick me if I didn't drop that. The next day he was drunk, and he went to Judge Thatcher's, and bully-ragged him, and tried to make him give up the money, but he couldn't, and then he swore he'd make the law force him. The judge and the widow went to law to get the court to take me away from him, and that one of them be my guardian. But it was a new judge that had just come, and he didn't know the old man, so he said courts mustn't interfere and separate families if they could help it. Said he'd rather not take a child away from its father. So Judge Thatcher and the widow had to quit on the business. That pleased the old man till he couldn't rest. He said he'd cowhide me till I was black and blue if I didn't raise some money for him. I borrowed three dollars from Judge Thatcher, and Pap took it and got drunk and went a-blowin' around and cussin' and whoopin' and carrying on, and he kept it up all over town with a tin pan till most midnight. Then they jailed him, and next day they had him before court, and jailed him again for a week. But he said he was satisfied, said he was boss of his son, and he'd make it warm for him. When he got out, the new judge said he was a-goin' to make a man of him, so he took him to his own house, and dressed him up clean and nice, and had him to breakfast and dinner, and supper with the family. It was just old pie to him, so to speak. And after supper, he talked to him about temperance and such things, till the old man cried, and said he'd been a fool, and fooled away his life, but now he was a-goin' to turn over a new leaf, and to be a man nobody wouldn't be ashamed of, and he hoped the judge would help him and not look down on him. The judge said he could hug him for them words, so he cried, and his wife, she cried again. Pep said he'd been a man that had always been misunderstood before, and the judge said he believed it. The old man said that what a man wanted that was down was sympathy, and the judge said it was so, so they cried again. And when it was bedtime, the old man rose up, and held out his hand and says look at it gentlemen and ladies all take a hold of it shake it there is a hand that was the hand of a hog but it ain't so no more it's the hand of a man that started in on a new life and'll die before he'll go back you mark them words don't forget i said them it's a clean hand now shake it don't be afeard so they shook it one after the other all around and cried the judge's wife, she kissed it. Then the old man, he signed the pledge, made his mark. The judge said it was the holiest time on record, or something like that. Then they took the old man into a beautiful room, which was a spare room, and in the night, sometime he got powerful thirsty, and clumb out on to the porch roof, and slid down the stanchion, and traded his new coat for a jug of four de rod, and clumb back again, and had a good old time and towards daylight he crawled out again, drunk as a fiddler, and rolled off the porch and broke his left arm in two places, and was most froze to death when somebody found him after sun-up, and when they came to look at that spare room, they had to take soundings before they could navigate it. The judge, he felt kind of sore. He said he reckoned a body could reform the old man with a shotgun, maybe, but he didn't know no other way. End of chapter 5
The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter Six. He went for Judge Thatcher. Huck decided to leave. Political economy thrashing around. Well, pretty soon the old man was up and around again, and then he went for Judge Thatcher in the courts to make him give up that money, and he went for me too for not stopping school. He catched me a couple times and thrashed me, but I went to school just the same and dodged him or outrun him most of the time. I didn't want to go to school much before, but I reckoned I go now to spite Pap. That law trial was a slow business, appeared like they weren't ever going to get started on it, so every now and then I borrow two or three dollars off of the judge for him to keep from getting a cow hiding. Every time he got money, he got drunk, and every time he got drunk, he raised cane around town, and every time he raised cane, he got jailed. He was just suited. This kind of thing was right in his line. He got to hanging around the widows too much, and so she told him at last that if he didn't quit using around there, she would make trouble for him. Well, wasn't he mad? He said he would show who was Huck Finn's boss. So he watched out for me one day in the spring, and catched me, and took me up the river about three mile in a skiff, and crossed over to the Illinois shore, where it was woody and where wouldn't no houses but an old log hut in a place where the timber was so thick you couldn't find it if you didn't know where it was. He kept me with him all the time, and I never got a chance to run off. We lived in that old cabin, and he always locked the door and put the key under his head nights. He had a gun, which he had stole, I reckon, and we fished and hunted, and that was what we lived on. Every little while he locked me in, and went down to the store, three miles to the ferry, and traded fish and game for whiskey, and fetched it home, and got drunk, and had a good time, and licked me. The widow, she found out where I was by and by, and she set a man over to try to get a hold of me, but Pap drove him off with a gun, and it wasn't long after till I was used to being where I was, and liked it, all but the cowhide part. It was kind of lazy and jolly, laying off comfortable all day, smoking and fishing, and no books nor study, two months or more run along, and my clothes got to be all rags and dirt, and I didn't see how I'd ever got to like it so well, at the widow's, where you had to wash and eat on a plate, and comb up, and go to bed, and get up regular, and be forever bothering over a book, and have old Miss Watson pecking at you all the time. I didn't want to go back no more. I had stopped cussing because the widow didn't like it, but now I took to it again because Pap hadn't no objections. It was pretty good times up in the woods there, taking it all around, but by and by, Pap got too handy with his hickory, and I couldn't stand it. I was all over welts. He got to going away so much too, and locked me in. Once he'd locked me in, and was gone three days. It was dreadful lonesome. I judged he had got drowned, and I wasn't ever going to get out any more. I was scared. I made up my mind I would fix up some way to leave there. I had tried to get out of that cabin many a time, but I couldn't find no way. There weren't a window to it big enough for a dog to get through. I couldn't get up the chimney. It was too narrow. The door was thick, solid oak slabs. Pep was pretty careful not to leave a knife or anything in the cabin when he was away. I reckoned I had hunted the place over as much as a hundred times. Well, I was most all the time at it, because it was about the only way to put in the time. But this time I found something at last. I found an old rusty wood saw without any handle. It was laid in between a rafter and the clapboards of the roof. I greased it up and went to work. There was an old horse blanket nailed against the logs at the far end of the cabin, behind the table, to keep the wind from blowing through the chinks and putting the candle out. I got under the table and raised the blanket. I went to work to saw a section of the big bottom log out, big enough to let me through. Well, it was a good long job, 
but I was getting toward the end of it when I heard Pap's gun in the woods. I got rid of the signs of my work and dropped the blanket and hid my saw, and pretty soon Pap came in. Pap weren't in good humor, so he was his natural self. He said he was downtown, and everything was going wrong. His lawyer said he reckoned he would win his lawsuit and get the money if they ever got started on the trial. But then there was ways to put it off a long time. The Judge Thatcher knowed it how to do it. And he said, People allowed there'd be another trial to get me away from him and give me to the widow for my guardian. And they guessed it would win this time. This shook me up considerable, because I didn't want to go back to the widow any more and be so cramped up and civilized, as they called it. Then the old man got to cussing, and cussed everything and everybody he could think of, and then cussed them all over again to make sure he hadn't skipped any, and after that he polished off with the kind of a general cuss all around, including a considerable parcel of people, which he didn't know the names of, and so called them what's his name when he got to them, and went right along with his cussing. He said he would like to see the widow get me. He said he would watch out, and if they tried to come any such game on him, he knowed of a place six or seven mile off to show me in, where they might hunt till they dropped, and they couldn't find me. That made me pretty uneasy again, but only for a minute. I reckoned I wouldn't stay on till he got that chance. The old man made me go to the skiff and fetch the things he had got. There was a fifty-pound sack of cornmeal, and a side of bacon, ammunition, and a four-gallon jug of whiskey, and an old book and two newspapers for wadding, besides some tow. I towed it up a load, and went back and sat down on the bow of the skiff to rest. I thought it all over, and I reckoned I would walk off with the gun and some lines, and take to the woods when I run away. I guessed I wouldn't stay in one place, but just tramp right across the country, most night times, and hunt and fish to keep alive, and so get so far away that the old man nor the widow couldn't ever find me any more. I judged I would saw out and leave that night if Pap got drunk enough, and I reckoned he would. I got so full of it, I didn't notice how long I was staying till the old man hollered, and asked me whether I was asleep or drowned. I got the things all up to the cabin, and then it was about dark. While I was cooking supper, the old man took a swig or two, and got sort of warmed up, and went to ripping again. He had been drunk over in town, and laid in the gutter all night, and he was a sight to look at. A body would a thought he was Adam. He was just all mud. Whenever his liquor began to work, he most always went for the government. This time, he says, Call this a government? Why, just look at it and see what it's like. Here's the law standing ready to take a man's son away from him, a man's own son, which he has had all the trouble and all the anxiety and all the expense of raising. Yes, just as that man has got that son raised at last and ready to go to work and begin to do something for him and give him a rest, the law up and goes for him. And they call that government? That ain't all, another. The law backs that old Judge Thatcher up and helps him to keep me out of my property. Here's what the law does. The law takes a man worth six thousand dollars and upwards and jams him into an old trap of a cabin like this and lets him go round in clothes that ain't fitting for a hog. They call that government? A man can't get his rights in a government like this. Sometimes I've a mind the notion to just leave the country for good and all. Yes, and I told him so. I told old Thatcher so to his face. Lots of them heard me and can tell what I said, says I. For two cents I'd leave the blamed country and never come near it again. Them's the very words. I says, look at my hat, if you call it a hat. But the lid raises up and the rest of it goes down till it's below my chin. And then it ain't rightly a hat at all. But more like my head was shoved up through a gin of stovepipe. Look at it, says I such a hat for me to wear one of the wealthiest men in this town if i could get my rights oh yes this is a wonderful government wonderful well looky here there was a free nigger up there from ohio a mulatter most as white as a white man 
he had the whitest shirt on you ever see too and the shiniest hat and there ain't a man in that town as got as fine clothes as what he had and he had a gold watch and chain and a silver-headed cane the awfulest old gray-headed nabob in the state and what do you think they said he was a professor in a college and could talk all kinds of languages and knowed everything and that ain't the worst they said he could vote when he was at home well that let me out thinks i what is the country a coming to it was election day and i was just about to go and vote myself if i warn't too drunk to get there but when they told me there was a state in this country where they let that nigger vote i draw it out i says i'll never vote again them's the very words i said they all heard me and the country may rot for all me i'll never vote again as long as i live and to see the cool way of that nigger why he wouldn't give me the road if i hadn't shoved him out of the way i says to the people why ain't this nigger put up at auction and sold that's what i want to know and what do you reckon they said why they said he couldn't be sold till he had been in the state six months and he hadn't been there that long yet there now that's a specimen they call that a government that can't sell a free nigger till he's been in the state six months here's a government that calls itself a government and lets on to be a government and thinks it is a government and yet it's got to sit stock still for six whole months before it can take a hold of a prowling thieving infernal white-shirted free nigger and pap was a goin on so he never noticed where his old limber legs was taking him to so he went head over heels over the tub of salt pork and barked both shins and the rest of his speech was all the hottest kind of language mostly hove at the nigger and the government though he give the tub some too all along here and there he hopped about the cabin considerable first on one leg and then on the other holding first one shin and then the other one and at last he let out with his left foot all of a sudden and fetched the tub a rattling kick but it weren't good judgment because that was the boot that had a couple of his toes leaking out of the front end of it so now he raised a howl and fairly made a body's hair rise and down he went in the dirt and rolled there and held his toes and the cussing he done then laid over anything he had ever done previous he said so his own self afterwards he had heard old salberry hagen in his best days and said it laid over him too but i reckon that was sort of piling it on maybe after supper pap took the jug and said he had enough whiskey there for two drunks and one delirium trempins that was always his word i judged he would be blind drunk in about an hour and then i would steal the key or saw myself out one or t'nother he drank and drank and tumbled down on his blankets by and by but luck didn't run my way he didn't go sound asleep but was uneasy he groaned and moaned and thrashed around his way in that for a long time at last i got so sleepy i couldn't keep my eyes open all i could do and so before i knowed what i was about i was sound asleep and the candle burnin i don't know how long i was asleep but all of a sudden there was an awful scream and i was up and there was pap looking wild and skipping about every which way and yelling about snakes he said they was crawling up his legs and then he would give a jump and a scream and say one had bit him on the cheek but i couldn't see no snakes he started and run round and round the cabin hollering take him off take him off he's biting me on the neck i never see a man look so wild in his eyes pretty soon he was all fagged out and fell down panting then he rolled over and over wonderful fast kicking things every which way and striking and jabbing at the air with his hands and screaming and saying there was devils a hold of him he wore out by and by and laid still a while moaning then he laid stiller and didn't make a sound i could hear the owls and the wolves away off in the woods and it seemed terrible still he was laying over by the corner by and by he raised up part way and listened with his head to one side he says very low tramp 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 that's the dead tramp 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 they're coming after me but i won't go oh the hair don't touch me don't hands off they're cold let go 
Oh, let a poor devil alone. Then he went down on all fours and crawled off, begging them to let him alone, and he rolled himself up in his blanket and wallowed in under the old pine table, still a begging, and then he went to crying. I could hear him through the blanket. By and by he rolled out and jumped up on his feet, looking wild, and he see me and went for me. He chased me round and round the place with a clasp knife, calling me the angel of death, and saying he would kill me, and then I couldn't come for him no more. I begged, and told him I was only Hook. But he laughed, such a screechy laugh, and roared and cussed, and kept on chasing me up. Once, when I turned short and dodged under his arm, he made a grab, and got me by the jacket between my shoulders, and I thought I was gone but I slid out of the jacket quick as lightning, and saved myself. Pretty soon he was all tired out, and dropped down with his back against the door, and said he would rest a minute, and then kill me. He put his knife under him, and said he would sleep and get strong, and then he would see who was who. So he dozed off pretty soon. By and by, I got the old split-bottom chair, and clumb up as easy as I could not to make any noise, and got down the gun. I slipped the ramrod down it to make sure it was loaded. Then I laid it across the turnip barrel, pointing towards Pep, and sat down behind it to wait for him to stir. And how slow and still the time did drag along. End of chapter 6